You have a shit lonely life. No one cares about your views. You're mad. <laughs> they sat me on November the 7th. And then the very next day, they were told about she Edwards. And he stayed on. Nadine's agent wrote to my agent saying, yeah, we should do a podcast or a show together. It was a polite no. I wanted to be a fighter pilot because I couldn't be an astronaut. Why? Why weren't you going to be an astronaut? Because I didn't have a penis. Oh. And I wasn't American. Mm. <laughs> My guest today likes to describe herself as just an old bird with an iPhone. Correct. But there's no need to be so humble. From countdown to drawing the ire of members of the Conservative government, she's always trodden her own path. Ripping up the celebrity rule book for women... Her choice to share her political views online led to her termination from the BBC, but it also led her to becoming one of Britain's fiercest anti-corruption campaigners and spearheads of tactical voting in the 2024 general election. Her new book, Now What? On a Mission to Fix a Broken Britain, details this journey into the political. And obviously, my guest today is Carol Borden. <laughs> How are you, Borders? I'm very good, thank you, Mr. Ollie. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you in the Joe studio. Well, you know I love Joe. I do know. You do You, know you say so in the book. Thank you very much. I, I, I certainly do. I have a good people to follow and good organisations to follow list. Mm. You're in there. Ava's in there. Joe's in there. What a All woman there. as well, Ava Santina. Yeah. One of my esteemed colleagues. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's start there then with, with, with the online. I mean... You're a, a trailblazer in terms of TV and media has changed. The media market has changed. Absolutely. I would just invite your sort of like initial reflections maybe on the changing media landscape, how it connects to politics, because this last election, I think you would have to say the digital realm has played a ginormous part in it. It was extraordinary. So let's start in the, with the most recent results, really. Mm. So only 52% of people who could have registered, not everybody registered, could have registered and voted, did so. Half. Yeah. And yet we had had, the disconnect is so vast, we've just had five years, 14 years, but certainly five, of the most discredited government, three prime ministers, in my lifetime. And I am an old bird with an iPhone. You tell me. Um, my first election was 1979. Uh, when Margaret Thatcher was first voted in. Anyway, so, that, so the disconnect is absolutely huge. And yet we have more news channels than ever before. Broadcast media has more political programmes than ever before. We, you know, we have Sky News, we have this, that and the other. And part of my issue, and I talk about it in the book, is this Westminster bubble. And what I love about social media is that it can crack it right open. And I've always been a devil. I've always got like one devil on this side. I'm, ba I'm very balanced. I have two devils, <laughs> one on each side of me. And, uh, and that's what I loved. And it's really been the first opportunity to use social media in that way, I've found anyway, mm. uh, leading up to, to the election. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Even, even all the trolling and all of that. Yeah, Bring it on, I you mean... are my oxygen, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a catalyst. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got, I will run through some of that trolling later on because it's extraordinary. And the seniority of the people as well who almost feel at liberty to talk to you in the way that they do is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Just on that point about apathy, Yeah. it terrifies me. I don't think it is apathy. I think the disconnect is that the Westminster bubble, London-based, uh, I'm not a Londoner. I'm not from the wealthy southeast. I grew up in poverty in North Wales. I moved to Leeds. We did countdown in Leeds at Yorkshire Telly for 26 years. Uh, you know, so I'm from there. I've lived in Bristol nearly 20 years now. I have lived in London at one point for about five years. But what has happened in that media landscape is that in the 1980s, I started in 1982, first show on Channel 4, Da, 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 da. First woman on Channel 4? I was the first woman to speak on Channel 4. <laughs> Sorry, was there, was there kind of like a parade well, of them before? Well, no, I thought I was the first woman on Channel 4 until somebody put it up on YouTube and I thought, oh, Mary. Oh, yeah, but Mary didn't say anything. Right. Mary was, Mary was Susie Dent that day. Got you. And um, But she never said anything. So I thought, oh, God. <laughs> you can't because say you have to remember, back then, we couldn't reference anything. Mm. There was no internet never even been thought of by Tim Berners-Lee by then. So it was like, oh, yeah, we think that's what happened. 
There's no way of checking. <laughs> no way of checking. Probably a slightly, probably a slightly easier way as well for you. You know, doing doing the LBC broadcasting that you do. Now you say something wrong, it's very easy for anyone who's listening to you. Just kind of Google it and be oh. like, "Oh, sorry, Carol, you've got that one wrong." Oh, every time. Back then, yeah. it would be a free. You sort of get away with it a little bit. Perhaps. Yeah, live broadcast was a live broadcast. Yeah. So we used to record us live. Anyway, so this this massive disconnect. It's not apathy. It's that politicians, and it's what I talk about, and, and the Westminster bubble, including a lot of the journalists, talk about politics in exactly the same way as they always have. They talk to the same politicians. It's the same faces talking to the same faces. I'm, I, I, I get absolutely furious when I see yet another disgraced politician being spoken to with deference. Mm. I mean, you know, the rest of us are sitting at home going, ask her about, you know, the lettuce, for instance. Ask her about the How dare you just sit there and not ask the questions that I need you to ask for me? Mm. So what's happened is not apathy. It's a di total disconnect. And social media can come in. At the moment, the far right are using it all too well, I believe. Mm. Uh, Joe is using it a lot better. But social media is very, very powerful. I mean, I, I you know, stop the Tories, stop voting, everything. No money, all volunteers, all social media. Almost two million postcodes typed in. Well, Get in there. Well done. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing that I like about publishing on social media is that I, I view it as a democratising force. Like at, at the end of the day, it's a deeply competitive space because your commentary, the content that we make... We're not just competing against other political broadcasters. We're not just competing against what BBC One is running at 7 p.m. Yeah. We are competing with every single video that has been published on YouTube, right? It's it's not just political content. It's cat videos. It's recipes. It's, ev yeah. it's, it's everything, right? We love a cat. We do, we do like a cat yeah. video. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but in, if you crack it and you get it right, other than the obvious sort of the control that the, ta the tech platform itself exerts yes. with its algorithm and content moderation, but beyond that... Yeah. The, 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 the regulation, the moderation isn't there. So you can, if you do it well, cause a bit of a stir, break into a bit yes. of a, a consensus and kind of hopefully disrupt um, sort of your competitors. And that's kind of what we've we've tried to do. Well, well, you're succeeding in that. And but I, you know, I hadn't been involved. Well, had I been involved in politics? I'd worked with David Blunkett twice right. when he was education secretary in the late 90s introducing, don't throw things at me, the numeracy hour mm. into primary schools. Oh, it was you, was it, Borderman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, so that was in the late 90s. I've got a photo, I've got short hair then, of me, Blair and Blanket all holding some number or other, and it's like, oh, that's a bit cringy. <laughs> but anyway. Time have changed a little bit. Uh, yeah, and then... I worked with David Blunkett again mm. in the early 2000s when the internet had just started getting going and a little girl called Sarah Payne had been murdered and um, our readers at the Daily Mirror, I used to have a big column in the Daily Mirror, just about this thing, this new thing called the internet. I mean, it really was a new thing. I had to explain what, what a website was. You know, it was that kind of basic. And, um, and they would saying, oh, Carol, what's it? I'm worried about my child. They're on a new thing called a chat room. And I think that the people who say that they are 12-year-old boys or 17-year-old aren't and that they're grown men, blah, blah, blah. So I did a lot of investigative work. It took me about 18 months, lots of documentaries about it. And then I got angry. And Jack Straw was the Home Secretary and they were, he wasn't interested in this whole thing. And I was talking in various committee rooms at, at, in the House of Parliament and they weren't listening. So I, I joined forces with a number of uh, chari children's charities and then pushed through. And then when David Blunkett, because I knew him before, mm. became Home Secretary, he put me on a task force and I was very proud about that because we uh, created the world's first law to make grooming a child online a criminal act because... By that point, they could groom, they could meet the child even, no crime committed. It was only when yeah. they actually assaulted the child previously that a crime had been committed and how ridiculous was that? Yeah. So so that, so I did that. And then, um, but there were always issues that, 
there were more issues rather than party politics or anything like that. That's what I wanted to pick you up on, right? Oh, yeah, you, you, you said, you know, was I political? And I think there's a kind of assumption or implicit in what you said is essentially, you know, if you're not party political, if you're not electorally political, is it politics at all? But actually, I would, as I'm sure you would say yourself... The personal is political, your your upbringing, your education. That... Absolutely. And I'm sorry to keep referring to the book, but that's well, exactly yeah. what I talk about, where yeah. my politics has come from. And I and so that so it's in three sections. So the first bit is what's politics, you know, online sometimes we go, oh, what's politics got to do with me? Oh, you you know, blah, 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 blah. literally everything, that's what I say. And I go through almost cradle to grave what politics has got to do to do with you so because a lot of people you mentioned the word apathy it isn't it's because they're being told constantly unless you understand how Westminster works nothing to do with you who are you to talk I mean I even get it from the trolls you know what you know nothing about politics it's a great impression yeah normally with, they can't spell politics but hey, you know um <laughs> but but it's and it's that that really angers me. It's like an arrogance that only the political class are allowed to talk about politics. Yes, how dare you? How? Yes. Yeah. And because of my background, and that's what I explained, this is where my politics came from. You know, in the 1960s, so uh, mum was a single parent, uh, three kids, four of us in one bedroom, um, one you know, bath of hot water a week to share between us. I was a baby, so I had first water, and then I'd be di literally dipped in, out. Then it'd be my brother and the thing, Sunday night before school, you know, all of that. And, and um, free school meals kid. And my uh, headmaster, so you have to go back to the 1960s. We were all poor. You know, if you're Catholic and you lived in the North, you were poor, basically, back then. And he used to be a deputy headmaster in Salford, when it was so rough, absolute, you know, rough, 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 rough. And he said, when I was there, I refused to let any of the children there leave without a reading age of 11, because that was the only monitoring exam that there was that was sort of national. And Mr. Gemmett, his name was, he was extraordinary. He was really strict. And very funny, and uh, and he said, yeah. I even had, when I met him as a grown up, he said, yeah. I even had a a, a Down syndrome boy there, and I wouldn't let him leave until he had the reading age of eleven. And he said because all children are capable. And from that school, you know, we were not expected to do well. Believe me, you know, we had Nitty Nora the Knit Nurse coming round most weeks, and. Uh, it was poor. We were all poor. And most of the kids were on free school meals. And he, from that collection of children, he said, no, you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be an accountant. You're going to be this. You're going to be a professional, which in those days, the leap was extraordinary. And and he did. And people went on. One, one of the lads went on to... Um, run air, I won't tell you which company it was, but a, a global media empire, you know, from little Ascomara, we called it, which is Welsh for uh, St. Mary's School. So Ascomara in real. Uh, and it was that because it was his politics was about we are born in the same way and actually you just need the breaks but you've got to be a grafter as well. Mm. So when you're born poor, you have to work harder. You have to keep but the, the situation down. was there where you, I'm not saying it was, the equality was marvellous, but it's more unequal, unequal now than it was then because we had a system of going to university, for instance. I somehow, uh, I was put ahead a year at school and when I did my A-levels, I did really well in my O-levels and my A-levels, um, uh, after my O levels, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, obviously, because I couldn't be an astronaut. Mm. 
Why? Why wouldn't you be allowed to be because an Because I didn't Carol? have a penis. Oh. And I wasn't American. Mm. And <laughs> Two things you can't do anything about, unfortunately. Well, there we are. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought, no, I'll, be, I'll join the Royal Air Force and be a fighter pilot, but I still didn't have a penis, so I couldn't join. But I thought at the time, what's the most appropriate uh, thing that I could do? Engineering. Ah. So maths and physics, I think. And I'd heard of this place called Cambridge, one from North Wales would be to Cambridge. It's like, even as a tourist, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, come back to the 70s. I think four colleges had turned from boys only to boys and girls colleges. And so I applied to one and I got in a year early. I went when I was 17. But I, I was on full maintenance grant. There were no such things as tutorial fees. And I, I talk about this because it's, is where your decisions are made. Mm. I could not have gone had it been under the system we have now. So that's all politics. Yeah. Uh, and so I fully appreciate what happened. I worked for the Central Electricity Generating Board when I graduated as an engineer. And underground, it was nationalised. You know, everything was nationalised then. And then obviously Thatcher started selling it all off. And... And here we are with the water, marvellous water industry that we have. Excellent. Gee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it is all politics. And mm. I think as I've got older, I've come to appreciate the historical decisions that have been made. Yeah. And the scandals. So given that what I've just said is that essentially, and you've proven, your, your life's journey is expressly political a lot of audiences will sort of say, well, Carol Borden's only really started talking about politics in the last couple of years or sort of popped up as a political figure, publicly yeah. political, perhaps. Yeah. And that is what the book deals with, right? It's that diary up to, well, over the last yes. few months. So the first part is about what's politics got to do with you. I talk about narcissism. Oh, <laughs> does politics love a narcissist? No, shocking. Yeah, doesn't really? it? Oh, it's remarkable. Um and the techniques that they use, DAVO, deny, you know, attack, reverse the role of victim and offender. And then you once you see it, I think all children should be taught it to, to observe it. It's like, oh, that's pretty obvious. What are they going to do next? You can predict the next thing they're going to do. Um, yeah, I, we never had parties. <laughs> yeah, It's a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. You know, blah, 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 blah. Party game I'm referring to, obviously. It's a good impression. Or, uh, yeah. Oh. And then the second bit, which is, I hope you've laughed out loud at parts of it, because I've cherry-picked some of the stories from Twitter that I've got involved in uh, over the last two years. Some of them are serious, but obviously the sacking from the BBC, uh, the five tweets, um, fairly innocuous stuff. Uh, and they sacked me on November the 7th, which I fully expected because I knew I'd broken this, these ridiculous social media so-called impartiality guidelines mm. and um, I put it all in and then the very next day they were told about she Edwards by the police about the serious nature of their investigation no charges had been made by that point and he stayed on same people Two decisions within 24 hours. Funny that, isn't it? I, I wonder if I'd been attacking anyone other than the Tory party, whether that decision might have been different. Provocative question to ask. Oh, I have. <laughs> but it's funny, isn't it, when the Director General was a former Tory councillor and chairman of the Hammersmith and Fulham uh, Conservative Party and Robbie Gibb was... Uh, uh, Theresa May's uh, director of communications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, now on the BBC board, and the BBC chairman Richard Sharp, who was disgraced, had to resign. Had given four hundred grand to the Tories, and so it goes on. Impartial? Mm, not so much. Do you think anyone can be truly impartial? You won't have to edit any of that out, by the way. It's not libelous. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't want to, Carol. I wouldn't want to anyway. Uh, although, no, as, as, as the editor of the thing, it takes on a new life because if you do publish something libelous, then it'll be me that ends up going to prison. So, uh, so. <laughs> There's no room, Ollie. Yes, no, it's yeah, true. I've, no got, I've got free, so free reign at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I've got free reign. <laughs> um, yeah. 
what, what was I saying? Do you think anyone can be truly impartial? Because in, in this, this conception of right, what the BBC should be, it's very noble, right? The idea that in your journalism, you can remove all bias, that, that it can be totally objective. And I don't know how feasible it ever will be to it to achieve that even if let's say you went in as a political reporter and said i'm going to be totally objective i have you know a classical academic training i i like i would like to think as an engineer i'm capable of recognizing truth fact and as I a want, scientist yeah i want to i want to be able to remove my biasy, biases from this do you think you'd be able to i wouldn't know <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like Richard Sharp, Tim Davey. This is revenge. Yeah. No, it's but it it's what it's the observation and the evidence. So what I've tried to do over the last two years is present evidence yeah. and obvious, you know, and and data facts that say, well, here is the evidence of VIP PPE lane, for instance. Uh, working with a good law project, who wonderful, or uh, all sorts of different things. Nadim Zahawi here, are a few facts about him that you might not be reading or seeing elsewhere. And then what gets me, and it really does get me, is that these politicians who are disgraced just pop up as though nothing happened on broadcast media. Mm. Where else can that happen other than in the political class system and the Westminster bubble? My friend, my colleague, well, friend and colleague, Ed Campbell, he, he one of his favourite talking points, and I love it when he says it, is why are you treating this person? It, I mean, it could be, could be anyone like Lee Anderson, whoever it is. Why are you treating them seriously? He's like, these people yeah. should be treated with derision. Like, yes. You should be deferentially asking them questions. Oh, um, you know, minister, please, won't you just tell me about X? Like, you should be yes. laughing them out of the room. Basically. Correct. Um, which might be why he doesn't get invited to many things <laughs> like that, because he doesn't really pull his punches. Um, but <laughs> it starts with Michelle Moan. You do this tweet and you talk about yeah. the sort of unwritten celebrity rule book and how yes. basically what you've done was kind of breach those unwritten rules. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so... When you're a woman, when you're a female celebrity, uh, like I say, I started in 1982. And so at that time, the only thing that, you know, TV shows were big shows back there. Everything was because there were only four channels. Mm. So you would present to the public, your audience, well... We didn't have an audience on Countdown. We had Countdowners, so Countdown is slightly different. You was, in many ways, a sort of um, prefix to like the Beehive or the Swifties. You had the Countdowners. We had the Countdowners. Yeah. We loved our Countdown. Anyone who said they could insult us. Mm. You know, people write terrible things about the show. Rich Whiteley and I were like, absolutely fine. We'd, we'd read it out. You know, you're terrible. You two are. I'm never, you know, half half of Devon doesn't watch you or dislikes you or something like that. And and we think it was hilarious. But insult our countdowners. Yeah. Then we were it's angry. It's on, yeah, it's war at that, that point. Were, that was not on. Um, so it's funny, isn't it, how it goes? So then you would have to go through the filter of an editor of a newspaper or a magazine. And people would read those things because pre-internet and so there were press offices and officers and it was all like oh let's you know make out to everyone that everyone's lovely <laughs> you know hide all the bad stuff and use the world to come in on a Sunday and explode someone you yeah. know or other uh, I'm not laughing about some of the stories they did but it's and then the internet changed that so the unwritten which I write in there uh, the unwritten celebrity rule book was be nice to the Daily Mail. Be nice to everyone who writes a column, particularly in the Daily Mail, because that used to be a powerful newspaper. Not so much nowadays. Um, be witty. Be pretty. Stay in your lane. Whatever you do, don't talk about politics, you know, etc., etc. Be nice to all journalists, even if they're not nice about you. Blah, 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 blah. Mm. So before I did... Uh, but it's different now because you can answer back through social media. And uh, so before I did my first political tweet, I suppose, which is about Michelle Moan, I had to consider that, ripping it up. And I also had to consider the fact that I was ringing a few of my journalist friends going, 
And why aren't you printing stuff about that? And they're going, well, because she keeps, they keep issuing these slaps, yep. you know, these, these legal threats effectively, and she'll sue you. No, she, uh, she won't. She will. She won't. She won't. She won't. She won't. She won't. I thought, ah, oh, bugger it. So I just thought, <laughs> and then I go, and sure enough, headlines, blah, 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 blah. But I felt, I, I genuinely felt a responsibility. And once I'd started and started scratching the surface about other issues, whether that was Nadim Zahawi and talking to Dan Needle about that, you know, wonderful. I call him the Robin Hood of tax lawyers. He, yeah. he prefers to be called Batman. Just so Sorry, you know. Sorry, okay, yeah. yeah I, just I, so you know. Yeah, fine. We'll, uh, we, we laugh about that quite a bit. And, um, and, the, and then that, other issues that many of the uh, higher brown newspapers, perhaps, like the Financial Times and so on, who are actually quite... Um, you would imagine the Financial Times to be quite right-wing and very city-biased, but actually their politics is really well-balanced. I don't know if you read it. But I do, yeah. It's, it, isn't it? I think it's a great paper. Yeah, I think, I think it is I think it's one of the truly... Look, there's a, it has a certain um, tilt to its economic analysis, which you would expect because it's the Financial yeah, Times. The city, yeah. It's the paper of the city. But actually, the political reporting I find to be very objective. The news reporting I find so to do be I. exceptional. I think it's a great... I genuinely would encourage anyone to read it, to be quite yeah. honest with you. Yeah, so, it's a really good paper. Absolutely. So, so it's all of these different things that, you know, and you think, hmm, okay, right, I'm in now. And, and I am one of those people in life that if I commit to something... I like jump in boots and all, you know. Two footed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that leads to well, okay. So we've we've spoken about the BBC. We un, we understand that you you sort of you go right. I've had enough of this. I'm going to start talking about this stuff. Yeah. BBC thing happens. Has there ever been a moment of? Well, there was one interesting thing, right? So the BBC introduced their social media guidelines in September. In my opinion to quell debate by their contributors. They will argue otherwise. Uh, but the first phone call came <laughs> earlier in the year when Richard Chop hadn't resigned by that point and I was tweeting out in capital letters. Wow. Right. Resign, Richard Sharp. <laughs> Resign, Robbie Gibb. Resign, William Shawcross. And they didn't like that. Giving the link to the BBC Complaints Office, which had that. And tell me when you've made your complaints. <laughs> so, like thousands of people going, done, tick, done, you know, everybody responding. Yeah. And I had the first phone call when I'd done about a week of that. Remarkable. Mm. Mm. Was there. Was... Was there, ah, was, there, ah, was there ever a moment, though? You Karen? have to laugh, though. You do have to laugh. But was there a moment where you doubt, where you, where you sort of went, you know what? Have I made a mistake? Should I do this? No. This I tell, you, shaking I tell you what I do nowadays, which amuses me greatly. I've, I've, because um, I'd written the book, it was called Out of Order, and it was meant to be a pre election book with an election in November. Mm. Right? All done. Nice. Boom. boom in. Then Sunak goes and calls the election. <laughs> <laughs> got to rewrite a bit of it, you know, got yeah. to re remodel it, I would say, and then mm. and write this plan for change at the end. So it's called Now What? Yeah. <laughs> Everything changed. So after the election, because it goes, the diary goes up to July the 5th, as you know, the day after the election. And, um, and then there's this plan for change, my kind of manifesto to tidy up the political class and politics. And, uh, and I just had, I spent the entire month, so I've been pretty quiet on social media for about seven weeks. Oh, the right wing is moaning. <laughs> Why aren't you commenting on this? It's like, well, you don't like me anyway, love. Yeah. It's like, what? and now you're moaning you're that I'm not I'm posting talking. enough. You're not happy you know? when I'm not talking. So I, and they are, and I thank them in the acknowledgements. I thank my trolls for being my oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm go I've got some here. That the thing that interests me about the kind of abuse you receive, yeah, for a lot of people in the public eye, it's usually from sort of um, faceless accounts. You know, male name, twenty numbers, like, <laughs> twenty numbers. You, you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? Yeah. The striking thing, and if you don't mind, I, I'm going to read some of them to you. Is are they in the book? <laughs> they are. They're from. I've lifted them from Twitter. 
They are... Go on. So these are from elected representatives. These are from MPs. MPs, right? marvellous. So this is, this is a former cabinet minister in Johnny Mercer, right? Yeah. You have a shit lonely life. No one cares about your views. You're mad. Marco Longhi, another Tory MP. A person who obviously... Former, former Tory MP. Very important, but, yeah. Oh, Johnny work. Mercer, former Tory MP and cabinet minister. Nothing more X than an ex-MP. Um, <laughs> a person who obviously has bitterness, arrogance and envy in her heart. Yeah, obviously. There's no amount of plastic surgery or Botox that will cure that. <laughs> former Tory deputy chairman, Lee Anderson MP, who's now reform. A former Labour. Yeah, yeah, former. make your mind There's up. There's a lot of formers there. There are. Yeah. X, X, X. Yeah. Single-use plastic. What should she do? What she should do is act her age, get the bus pass out, go and enjoy life. Now, in all of those three tweets, <laughs> I would say that's just out-and-out out sexism. That's just it's just misogyny. Do you know? What? And, and well, I, it is. That's elected representatives talking to you as a high-profile woman, and I don't really know what to say to it other than it's just completely and utterly outrageous. And I, I, I guess the fact that they've been kicked out now is kind of vindication of the fact that like they're. Yeah. <laughs> half of the electorate who happen to be women are like actually we don't like it when you talk about women in this <laughs> exactly, way guys yeah but it's, yeah they're not bright enough to like cotton on to that fact but anyway <laughs> but uh, is it is it as a woman who's traditionally sort of gone into these male dominated spaces and not only kind of happily gone into them but succeeded in them yeah is it water off a duck's back it's totally water off a duck's back totally I mean they shouldn't be doing it right and I understand when some of the other girls get genuinely upset about it, but it really is water off a duck's back. I grew up on building sites. I grew up... And, and, and the banter, that is not banter, by no. the way. But I, I used to work underground, I think I mentioned it earlier, with 2,000 men and me underground. The, you know, one lot, this <laughs> wants to fight underground. So Brendan, who was the Irish concrete gang at Foreman, he was great. He was like my best friend. And then there was another guy who was a steel... Ganger is another word for foreman. Right? So he was the reinforced steel steel ganger. And he did not like me. And he was always shouting stuff. At, you know, uh, uh, you shouldn't be down here. You know, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, they had a fight once. I thought it was hilarious. Brendan won. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. My champion won, yeah. Send, send, your, <laughs> send your best. Send your best man. <laughs> Send your best man. So, no, it, it, it's wrong that they do it and they should be called out. And, and I did call them out uh, often on it. But it, I found it interesting because then they took all this absolute mm -mm about, oh, it's nobility of service. I'm here. It's my duty to the public. Mm. And they said, no, you're not. You're this self-serving prat. You know, from the last parliament, most of them. Yeah. Let's be honest. Mm. Uh, and and what I found over those two years is that's what most people thought. Um, and they were right. And that's why the Conservatives went down to their lowest number of MPs in their entire history. So, yes, <laughs> marvellous. Did you have to develop coping mechanisms? Is Is... The way we're talking about these guys now and laughing at them as they rightly deserve. Yeah. Derision. Derision is a coping mechanism. It's not a coping mechanism. I, I, a coping mechanism. I'm good. I find at the moment it's all the far right wing bots, right? Oh, they can't. I mean, hundreds of them. It's, it's very dull, actually, because I want to get to the interesting answers, mm. you know, when I put a post up. And it's, it's more annoyance that I'm having to scroll through this sewer of... But it doesn't, doesn't touch me. Mm. It just... It's just annoying. Um, Is that, do you think there's, there's power in that? That you derive power from being unaffected by things like oh, that? I love it. I deliberately do some stuff nowadays. I love doing a poll about Kamala Harris versus Trump. Get some going. <laughs> <laughs> It's fantastic. Go, oh, particularly when she first came out, and I was going, "Oh, and she's she's uh, she's equal with her." No, she isn't. Oh, and now she is, and of course now she is ahead. I mean, it's still very much in the balance. But um, I put it out, and then 
I'll wait a few hours and then I'll do like, I'll answer my own tweet, you know, mm. and say, ha ha, I <laughs> got you going again, didn't got you, I? You got know? you riled up. And then you get all that. Oh, bless them. Do you think, this is an interesting one actually, with your perspective, do you think it's gotten easier to be a woman in the public eye? Do you think it's in the same way that social media has kind of revolutionised the way we communicate and our political uh, spaces? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's two way. Um, so when it was always through the filter of an editor, I went to the BAFTA, it's the year 2000, 21st century. I was th age 39, and I went to the BAFTAs in a short blue dress. And the next day, it was like I'd murdered not just my own grandmother, but everyone else's. Because I was 39, and I'd worn a dress above the knee. BBC made an entire Kilroy show on that basis, should a woman of this age wear a dress above the knee? Went on for about 18 months. Front page after front page of this. Like, I mean, it's absurd. Mm. And now you, you laugh at it. But that's been my life. I laughed at it then. But, it, but that's how things have changed positively. And w what I really love now, because my generation would be, you know, they're, not me all the time, you know, oh, oh, and she's this and she's that, and, uh, you know, all the ones who write for the Telegraph and the Mail. Um, oh, and she's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But now there are generations of women younger than me who feel like I do. Mm. So I didn't have the support when I was younger because there weren't, they were still kids, if that makes sense, and now and now they're grown up. So, so I find it I find it a lot easier. But equally, there's this extreme misogyny, which is a which is a worry, which is all linked to the kind of far right stuff. Um, and I, that's something that all of us have to really, you know, push through safeguarding on that uh, in with before the next election. That's what that's where I'm sort of targeting now yeah I, I, yeah you asked if you were to ask the question now of like women on social media you said oh at what age would it be appropriate for a woman when should a woman wear a skirt above the knee and they'd say whenever the fuck she wants to exactly it's the, the appropriate age um but your point there about uh, extreme misogyny and men online and shaping their attitudes is one that's really important to me and one i care a lot about i mean it's it's part of the fucking raison d'etre of the entirety of Joe, right? It's like yeah, if you exactly. don't if you don't um, communicate to men, if you don't speak to them in a way that's not condescending, that's not patronising, you talk about their issues, you talk about how to make themselves better. If you leave a vacuum, if you vacate the terrain, it is not surprising that some incredibly toxic a actors, people like Andrew Tate and others, fill that space and fill those guys' heads with nonsense. Because if you don't speak to them, they'll go, oh, at least this guy is. At least he's someone, oh, he's speaking about my problems. He's talking about loneliness. He's talking about how oh, I can't get a girlfriend. He's talking about X, talking about Y. And all of a sudden you start listening and then obviously the path spirals and you end up in a much more extreme place. But I think it's, I think it's, very, I think it's hugely important to still talk to, to talk to them and to not kind of abandon oh, the is. playing field. In it absolutely way. is. And, and, you know, there are women who can be very misogynistic. There are absolute out there um and one of my things for next year is ab absolutely about bringing women together obviously to, i mean most men are great it, it's that a lot of the right-wing papers and so on they discuss things in a particular way denny male's business model is to set one woman against another very successful don't ever read the comments. I remember in the early days of Daily Mail Online, right? And uh, you know, sometimes I would have, there'd be four stories about me in one day. It's a vaudeville and block out it, of it, a sidebar it, it, of shame. Less to so wash now. out. Less so now. Um, but it would be. So I read one thing and read the comments. It's early days. Mm. And it was, <laughs> so I thought, I wonder what they say about other people. So then I read, I think it was about Cheryl Cole or something like that. Again, it was... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought, oh. And then there was a story about Tom Jones. Now, I'm Welsh. He is a god, mm. right? The god, the deity, yeah. Sir Tom. And the story was 
as far as I can remember, something about he'd had to cancel a concert. So he would have been in his 60s then, right? He had to cancel a concert uh, for health reasons. And, and that was the story. I thought, what have they said about Tom? Well, it was hilarious because it was like, he's had his 15 minutes of fame. He's an old guy. He should just retire. You know, and it was exactly the same stuff. This is this is really important, and I'm glad you've raised it because, quite as a journalist, when people talk about and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of sort of editorial malpractice in things like the sidebar of shame and other tabloid journalism. But yeah. nonetheless, you you can't um, exonerate the audience for it because the relationship between the people creating that type of content and the people consuming that content is symbiotic. You know, there's a reason they, they, they write those stories and it's because those people in the it's comment clickbait. section, yeah, they read them, it makes them angry. They feel, like, you, can't, you can't exculpate yourself. You can't just say, oh, it's terrible that they do this. The, the conversation is more complex than that. Well, it is, but I would advise anyone to, because I haven't read the Daily Mail for like, I mean, I don't know how long. Mm. Um, obviously I don't have the app, I don't, go there your life's so much better without it you'd be happier well your life is better without it and uh and most of what they write is rubbish and i don't i think that's where we go back to the whole social media media thing is where you have to provide your own filter in a sense as to what am i interested in just because other people are reading it doesn't mean you should um i mean it's fundamentally their online site is just a celebrity magazine now, isn't it? Mm. But it's always a she's got, she's got, well, I don't know because I don't read it. It used to be sweat patches, cellulite, all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's very know. much like women wears bikini, basically, is the kind of, the, the yeah, I know. For shame, for shame. Um, something else you write about in the book in 2022, um, which I'd like to talk to you about. You talk, You, you mentioned that, so you, well, you credit it, credit it with strengthening your resolve. You talk about the fact that you had to deal with two stalkers. Yes. Obviously, to the extent that you're comfortable talking about it, would you mind telling me a little bit about that experience and what you mean when you say it's strengthened who you are? Well, I'm not going to give too many details because I've got lawyers involved. I had uh, two paparazzi who were following me during the first lockdown, and that was deeply upsetting because they were outside my house, wouldn't go... Um, and and the police got involved with them and uh, eventually cautioned them officially, which meant that if they did it again, then it would immediately go CPS, then uh, take it as a case. Um, but they backed off and went away. But I thought when uh, these two um, were around, I don't get to say too much i'd say stalkers in inverted commas if you like uh harassers however you'd like to put it um well tell uh, me about your reaction to it then if my you reaction the was of it. absolute astonishment and the detail and uh it was horrendous it involved it got they got my daughter involved and all sorts of, and it was like I didn't understand it. I, I, I couldn't comprehend it. And so um, I got lawyers involved with that. And then after that, you know, and then, and then I... Uh, and they had to sign something that means if they break that, it immediately becomes a criminal case. Mm. I, I, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a, it's not just a contract. It's, yes. it's something deeper than that. The, the, reason I'm, the reason I'm asking, though, is you, you say it strengthened you. It, yeah, and it did strengthen me. And I thought, it, what I'm, I'm not very good at fighting for myself, but I'm really good Stop at fighting it. on behalf of other people. I don't believe that for a second, Carol Warden. Well, not good at fighting for yourself. You come, come, look, where you, look where you are. Look at the person you are. It's very demure. I appreciate it. It's very modest. You're right. It's, it's, an impre it's an impressive thing to say. But like you have got time and time again, the first woman to speak on Channel 4 News, you know, the, 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 way that you, the way that you've conducted yourself politically recently, you are an impressive woman. Like clearly, clearly oh, you are. Oh, well, it took more. You're an, you're an impressive person. You, I just, I can't, I can't tolerate the well, that, that Well, that's, well I, I don't say it as a, um, as a false thing to say. If some, 
Okay, so I can defend myself against a troll. I just like bat them away. Yeah. But if I'm defending somebody else, so when I've been doing the political stuff, I feel as though, so a lot of people are saying, I felt I had no voice and now I feel as though you've given me a voice. So, you know, you can be my voice, Carol. And uh, so in so I felt that that responsibility. Um and then I'm like a tigress. Then I'm like, oh now, baby. Um, I'm really going for it. So after that experience in 2022, I thought, what about all those girls who, you know, I'm a wealthy woman now. So I can afford lawyers without even batting an eyelid and lawyers don't come cheap mm. and I thought what about those girls if far worse happens to them there is nowhere for them to go they can't afford lawyers the police generally uh, don't do much when there's uh, this kind of thing happens as we know um, and then I thought no I've got to do something to to, I've got. I've. If I can't find a voice, then they can. So it's all kind of mixed up, really. Mm. Um, later in the year, that kind, that sort of sense. And next year, I, I really want to bring a lot of women together because it's time. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure you'll be able to. It's, it's yeah. interesting uh, how instructive for you. I think. I don't always put words in your mouth, but having access to sort of changing your circumstances, becoming a wealthy woman, as you've just described yourself as, I guess, having power in a way that a lot of women don't feel, that can kind of provide a perspective where you can sort of look back, not that you weren't aware of it in the first place, but go, good grief, you know, how lucky am I to be able to, X happens, I can in instruct Y. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And, and actually, go, in a way, almost be disarming to be like, Christ, if I wasn't in the position I am, it would be a very, very different situation. Well, it would be. And that's, that's why I, I kind of sit, you know, in my 60s, I've had my TV career. So what if I'm never on telly? I mean, so what, really? And? Um, and it's like the thing with the BBC. No, it's my... You told me that I basically had to shut up. And I was thinking, well, I'm not going to. Mm. So, but I can afford to do that. And, mo you know, a lot of people can't. So I felt as though I had to carry on, really. You might not be on the BBC, but you might be able to have a podcast with Nadine Dorries. Oh, that was funny, <laughs> wasn't it? How funny was that? Yeah. There's all these little gossipy stories. In, um, I love it. Yeah. Her agent. I'd, I'd tune in. I'd listen to it. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> well, you, it would be, it would be what, you, what, you just, what you'd said about treating these people with deference and respect. It would just be an hour long of you sort of giggling and laughing at her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would only do one, wouldn't it? But Ollie's referring... <laughs> to a story that I've put in where uh, uh, lovely Nadine's agent wrote to my agent saying, yeah, we should do a podcast or a show together. It was a polite no. Very polite. Very polite no was the answer. A kiss at the end of the text message. <laughs> um, let's talk about where the diary ends, 2024 general election. Yes. Tell me about polling night. Where were you? What were you up to? So polling night was... was Ooh, that was an all-nighter. So I went to the Channel 4 studio first. Had a little bit of a... They were all right. They were like, mm, let's <laughs> talk about... you know. So the exit poll had come out. Yep. And I was very disappointed because it said that the Tories were likely to win 131 seats. Well, it was like a death had happened in my family. Because <laughs> I, I was hoping they'd only get 70. Yeah. So I was genuinely hoping that the Lib Dems would come into second place didn't happen as we know but everyone in the studio and I thought oh come on so I was like, let's get the party started you know <laughs> blah, 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 blah. um so I did that then I went to LBC studio stayed there for a couple of hours with lovely Andrew Ma and uh, Sheila Fogarty what a woman she's a, I love Sheila because obviously she's a scouser now, Rill, where I went to school, I'm like, you know, North Wales is not far. I don't know if you know that part of the country. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we have people in common. And it was, and obviously we both, she's Irish family, hence Catholic, blah. And I was telling her the story uh, of going to Scylla Black's funeral. And um, 
about Paul O'Grady, who was a good mate, and he stood up. And Scylla's funeral was amazing, and it was very funny in places, right, which she, genuinely she would have loved. And Paul O'Grady stood up, obviously, again, brought up as a Catholic scouser. Birkenhead. And he was going, oh, Robert, <laughs> uh, elders, oh, Robert, I'm going to tell a story about your mother now. Don't listen. He's going like that. So he's, he's out to the audience, and he's going... Well, I took Scylla to this gay club in New York and the bishop, Bishop Tom, was sitting behind him. This is all on the altar, right? He's going, sorry, Bish. <laughs> and, and he'd go, anyway, he went in and he was describing what was going on. In this uh, and he'd go, oh, sorry, Bish. <laughs> and at the end, he went down a round of applause, right? Paul sits down and Bishop Tom stands up <laughs> and goes, Paul O'Grady. Ten Hail Marys and three Our Fathers. <laughs> I've never had penance at a funeral before. He goes like this. <laughs> so I'm telling Sheila this story in the LBC office. She goes, Bishop Tom, I know him. <laughs> Tom, I can't remember. Oh, my gosh, she's never known him years. So I love Sheila. Yeah, it's absolutely. Funny, but these crossovers, you yeah. know, when your Small lives world. go. Yeah, Small world, things. isn't it? Um, we've spoken a little bit about well, we've spoken a lot about the past. We've we've mentioned in 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 reference to the future. Yes. And the book is, of course, called Now What. So tell me a little in a little bit more detail. What is next for you? Do you expect to continue to be political? Do you expect to continue yes. to campaign? Tell me. Yes, I do. Um, there are certain things that I want to get involved in, actively involved in that. But I only want to get involved in them if I think I can help in some way. So a lot is about almost teaching women or encouraging women to find their voice because women really have to speak up more because it, we've got a horrific election in five years' time and the results of that could change this country for decades and that's where I'm focused. Um, I want politics, which is what the last bit, as you know, is a plan for change, all sorts of changes that I, I would want, proportional representation and mandatory voting, um, or just mandatory voting first. Uh, um, duty of candour, which obviously we know with all the Grenfell fire, we talk about, I talk about that. Um, codes of conduct, which are ridiculous. There is no code of conduct. I mean, Nolan what principles. Do you mean? Good chap theory, I don't think they know how to spell Nolan. Mm. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, it, it's. Uh, oh, yes, as you know, it's. And, and it stands for this and it stands. Uh, not a, I mean, it's absurd. Just the run up to the election. Mm. Was, you couldn't have written it in a worse manner. But um, I, I, those are the things I want to centre on um, from the outside, forcing them, in a sense, to tidy up their own act. And also, uh, then I think all of us have to come together. Um, to really see what's going to happen in the 2029 election. Yeah, it's going to be a big one, no yeah. doubt about that. Uh, one Bigger of the than the last one. Mm. Yeah. One of Step the... one was eviscerating the Tories. Mm. Tick. Step two to come. Um, Carol, I think one of the themes of this interview has kind of been the, the, the sort of the, the power of not caring in a way. that there's, yeah. it's, it's very self-affirming to be able to minimise or even ignore your naysayers and, and criticism. And you write, um, for me, an older woman gets her power when she truly doesn't care what others think of her anymore. And I wonder if that, if you could speak to that younger version of yourself before she goes underground with 2,000 men, yeah. <laughs> before she is the first woman to speak on Channel 4 News, before she gets back <laughs> from the BBC for deciding to talk about politics and breaking the unwritten rules of being a, a woman in the public eye. Is that what you would say to her? I mean, she was a stubborn little madam. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she didn't need to hear it. Yeah, she didn't yeah. care already. I wouldn't say she was awkward. She was slightly on the stubborn side. Mm. Um, what would I say to her? Well, maybe not to be as much of a workaholic as I am. I've, I've always been guilty of that. Mm. I, I think it is a slight addiction. And then you hit the wall of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. You probably know that, Ollie. I do, yeah. Yeah. And and then you go, oh, I'm exhausted. And about 
16 hours later, you go, oh, no, I'm fine again now, and yeah, off yeah, you go. Off and you go and again, there's yeah. no... I find that levelling out difficult. Yeah, but I don't know what I'd advise her because I'm still doing the same, exactly the same. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. Isn't it? It's one thing to be able to say. I, I say it quite often. You know, oh, do you live to work? Would you work to live? Like, what's the balance of the priorities in your life? And then kind of go back. If you actually are sli even slightly self-effacing about it, Ollie, you you work seven days a week, so you should probably sort of dial it back a little bit. Um, but it's very easy to give the advice to other people. It's harder to live by yourself. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Carol Vorderman, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank oh, you so much for coming in. Oh, it's lovely to finally make it to Jen. Yes, very glad to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ollie.